can you give us an idea of some uh, traditional understandings of reading fluency and what it is um, in your field? Um, the traditional one is unfortunately very impoverished. It's basically what is the 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 speed of of an accurate decoding of mm -hmm. a word or um, of connected text, and that is just impoverished. <laughs> mm -hmm. So for me, fluency mm -hmm. is the composite of all these underlying processes which contribute to the speed and accuracy of decoding a word and understanding it. What has been missing um, is that the thought is that if you just get faster, you are becoming more fluent. Well, fluency is a bridge. It is a bridge, a living bridge, a physical bridge, because it's really the speed of connections in the brain, connections of all its parts, but the emphasis should be on the connection of all its parts. Mm -hmm. <laughs> and that's really missing from how people think about fluency. So one of the things that we try to do in that article and an earliest article was with uh, my Israeli colleague, uh, uh, Tommy Katsir. Um, we really looked at what are all the underlying processes? And of course, everybody thinks visual. Well, visual is just one piece, very important piece. But fluency requires um, that orthographic or representation, let's say, of a Hebrew character or mm -hmm. any, any, any letter or any character. Uh, it has to be represented in that visual area but that's just the beginning and mm -hmm. a, a lot of people actually stop there they think the faster you recognize it the faster you will decode it that's the beginning the visual word form area in the brain is making over time like a storehouse um these characters would have to be literally and physically represented to learn. And mm -hmm. the more you are exposed, and this is part of fluency, the more you are exposed, the stronger the representation. Mm -hmm. So when people um, in reading, for example, uh, um, use a, a kind of a mindless term, drill and kill, mm -hmm. <laughs> They aren't understanding that the brain needs multiple exposures. So that's not drill and kill. That's giving enough exposures to represent. Now that's the beginning, but then that has to be connected to the sound representation, the phoneme, which gives us the correspondence rules between a given character and its sound. So that those are two pieces. The pieces that most people neglect, however, are the ones underlying the other connections that aid fluency, that is vocabulary. And I know when you, just even from the notes that you've sent me, that there is always going to be um, an emphasis on vocabulary and grammar, rightly so. And I would say it's very important, I, I would say, only 10% of teachers really know this um, when they teach reading English, that mm -hmm. fluency is aided by not, not only the visual and the phonemic, but very importantly, by the knowledge of the word and its associations, including its grammatical uses. So mm -hmm. the grammatical use, especially when we talk about fluency for connected text, Mm -hmm. plays a very important role. It plays a mm -hmm. less, uh, if, uh, if you will, a, a less obvious role in a single word, but most of your work and mine is on connected text. Mm -hmm. So fluency has to have that grammatical um, uh, knowledge added to the vocabulary, added to the phoneme and the, the visual. And then you add, which is is especially important in Hebrew, the morpheme, the morphological knowledge in Hebrew is 
almost more important than the other than in other languages. Mm -hmm. English has been misrepresented as a phone, basically a phonemic language. Mm -hmm. It is also a morpho phonemic language. Our roots are the basis for many a spelling pattern that might mm -hmm. seem obscure or archaic. Um, I had the great pleasure <laughs> and effort of studying with both Noam and Carol Chomsky, and they both used the example muscle to illustrate how the C is, you know, it's useless. Why is it there? Well, it's there because when you look at the root system of the morphemes, it connects it to muscular, musculature, mm -hmm. etc., mm -hmm. where it was essential. So morphology is very important to orthographic spelling patterns. And this is something that in your study of Greek and uh, especially Hebrew, you you know more than most people why morphemes are so important. Yeah. So mm -hmm. fluency requires all these. And then for connected text, it is aided also by prosody. Interestingly mm -hmm. enough, a lot of people e e emphasize prosody more than semantics and grammatical and morphological knowledge. It's it's in there, but it is not, it should not be the, the next thing you do after mm -hmm. what a lot of people do is what's called repeated reading. You mm -hmm. read the same passage over and over again. Well, that is um, one intervention. The interventions need to go after all of these parts and very importantly, connect them. Yeah, no, that that's extremely helpful. Um, it's interesting that you talked about how um, at least from your side of things, there's often a heavy emphasis on the orthographic and phonemic um, side of things. And then it kind of stops before the vocab and grammar and morphemes. In our field, it's the exact opposite. It, I mean, a lot, of, a lot of people would struggle to read a Greek or Hebrew text. Like people who have completed a couple semesters of these languages will struggle to be able to read a text out loud because they just haven't focused on yes the sound those sorts of things yeah exactly um and the i think the one of the part of the reason that's the case is um <clears throat> most people aren't interested in learning to speak or co have conversations in these languages not too um, many people could talk <clears throat> to them yeah yeah there are there are people who can though um so yeah, so let's let's get back to to your understanding of reading fluency. So you talked about your a definition that's more component based, and you walked us through some of uh, the components. You also say suggest that we need a definition that is developmental. Can you unpack w exactly what you mean by that? Um, I wish I had my diagram in front of me to show you, but um, the reality is that you want to emphasize certain things more over time. Mm -hmm. And in the beginning, it will depend on the individual. Now, you and I have different audiences. For me, the children's um, development is what I am, you know, bent set on, on helping. And so for some, developmentally, they come especially after COVID, especially if they are in some of the poverty stricken communities that we know are in our own backyards, they are going to need more emphasis on semantics mm -hmm. and grammar than others. They are, mm -hmm. they, that's going to be really, really important. Um, and then that becomes more, if you will, modulated over time as they become more and more if you will, fluent comprehend readers, they'll still need it. Mm -hmm. But depending on where they are when they begin, they re we really have to figure out. And, and when I say figure out, I mean uh, not diagnose, but assess, screen for those component parts. How do they know their letters? How well do they know their phonemes? How, how is their language uh, vocabulary developing? Do they have a sense of, of the grammar of that language that they have to read? Because they mm -hmm. often are coming from a different language. 
So all these things are going to be changing over time and we have to be um, vigilantly monitoring what they need developmentally. Mm -hmm. And then at, as, as you, I think, know, because in my reader come home, I, I quoted Alberto Mangel about how everything we read is cumulative and it proceeds, I think he used the beautiful term, in geometric progression. And so it is. We, our vocabulary becomes more developed over time with what we read. So also is our grammatical complexity. But some mm -hmm. aspects of grammar are, especially from adults, implicitly known. Mm -hmm. So some aspects are developing and that refers more to the grammatical density or complexity that's involved uh, rather than you know, um, parsing verbs or something, you know, conjugating mm -hmm. verbs. So we, we have different aspects that are developing over time. Yeah. Yeah. That's very helpful. Um, in terms of the components, again, that you shared, um, you kind of divide them up to some degree between what you refer to lower level processes and higher level processes. So lower level would be things like the orthographic and phonological awareness and things like that, um, among many other, and then many others. And then higher level would be things like comprehension, for example. Um, so can you talk a little bit about the relationship between lower level processes and higher level processes? Yeah, and I'm taking my jacket off so you're gonna see a physical rendition of this diagram, <laughs> which is kind of embarrassing to do, but what the heck. So this, think of this as foundational skills. Let's make a box, okay? Foundational skills, much, much has to happen. All these processes that are, you know, whether we call them letter, phoneme, all these processes, all the fluency related processes are developing. So this is foundational skills. At no time, are there no comprehension, but comprehension is like this. It's coming in, you know, so when I, you know, instruct my teachers or whomever, or write even interventions, we still always have connected text, even if it's two word sentences, three mm -hmm. word sentences. But then over time, the foundational skills go like this and the comprehension skills are taking over. So here's right. a developmental arc for mm -hmm. comprehension. And the comprehension skills are really what I call deep reading processes. Mm -hmm. So I'm I'm I think comprehension is a nice basket, but it for a cognitive, you know, to think cognitively about it is much more interesting but also more important. So now the foundational skills if you notice they're still there. Right. So, and the fluency skills that are foundational have have transposed actually into more higher level kinds of semantic and grammatical, um, if you will, processing. But mm -hmm. there's also, and I'm sure this is true in Hebrew. It certainly is true in English. The need for multisyllabic pattern knowledge that is increases now that that's a foundational skill letter pattern knowledge or mm -hmm. character pattern knowledge is a foundational skill but it still exists and the more um if you will advanced you are you are encountering words you hadn't met before and you are applying these skills but in a multi-syllabic so right. it in in a way they always exist for each other so I think one way you put it is, uh, well, a paraphrase is that um, the more automatic you become in the lower level processes, the more like effort you can um, put toward the higher level processes, allocate. Yeah. So glad you said that because um, when I talk about fluency, I am after automaticity of decoding. Mm -hmm. And as you become automatic, and when I mean automatic, I mean virtually right. automatic mm -hmm. recognition. And that rec that automaticity is aided by all this knowledge. It's aided by it. But as it becomes automatic, you then literally allocate all this, all this energy 
now goes into here. Right. So you now have almost, inst it's almost like this. Yeah. And then this instantaneously gets what we would have ordinarily spent, if, especially if you're a first grader, you're spending mm -hmm. millisecond after millisecond just decoding the darn word. Right. The, all those are now devoted to understanding the word, the words, the context, and then uh, obviously as, as, as language becomes more abstract, the abstruse meanings, the levels of meaning, the perspective taking, all these deep reading processes, right. you have more time. You do not have time enough for deep reading if you are literally stuck here. Right. Right. And and this is something you could like most people have probably experienced to some degree, or you can certainly see um yeah, when people are, are learning a second language, you can you can read an entire text and by the end of it have no clue what happened because you're so focused on whether it be identifying words or or thinking about the sounds, how to actually pronounce them. Right. Um that by the end you're like i have no clue and you have to go back and kind of do it all again two or three times that's yeah. right and that's the problem of, of <clears throat> especially one form of dyslexia which is like a fluency based dyslexia um though most kids with dyslexia like 75 percent, have some kind of fluency issue one group in particular has no phoning problems at all but it's just what you're saying they they can't read fast enough to get the meaning 